Please welcome Darius Kazami. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, it's an honor to be here today talking to my fellow creators. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you the story of how I got to where I am today. <laughs> Ever since I was a child, I wanted to win the lottery. I think it started when I would visit my grandmother as a child. Every night at 6 o'clock, we watch action news on WPVI Channel 6. We weren't really watching for the news. At 6.59, the Pennsylvania Lottery daily number was drawn, and we'd hold our breath until that first little ping pong ball came out of its pneumatic tube. She never won, but it gave me hope, and it was my strongest memory of the strongest woman I knew. Needless to say, the lottery soon became an all-consuming passion. In every spare moment I had, I doodle numbers in notebooks, the margins of pages, wherever else I could think. This is my life. That passion stayed with me through my teen years and into my college days. By the time I hit my early 20s, I set aside every day to buy a lottery ticket and improve my craft. Although I didn't see it as improving my craft, really what the lottery had become for me was a way of processing what happened to me every day. When I got into a fender bender, I used the numbers from the other guy's license plate. <laughs> if I met a girl at a bar, I'd incorporate her phone number into my work. It's very important to me. There was a period of my life where I was going through some awful medical problems, and I played the numbers that I found around me every day at the hospital, and it took an awful, isolating ordeal and provided me a way to share it with my friends and family. I didn't have a lot of success as a lottery player at first, but I kept doing it. <laughs> and more importantly, I started sharing my experience on the internet with my lottery blog. <laughs> it began as a daily journal of the numbers that I played, but it became so much more over time. <laughs> Not only... Thank you. Thank you. A great blog. Not only did this experiment keep me active as a content creator. <laughs> but it also, very slowly, built up a wonderful community. A community of lottery players I still talk to to this very day. The most freeing thing about this blog was the feedback loop between myself and my small group of dedicated fans. I'd start to get feedback from them. Here's one, one great example. I'll always remember this. My mom's birthday was coming up. So I played her birthday, you know, as you do. And one of my fans commented on the post for that day and said, hey, I know your mom's birthday is coming up, but have you considered mixing it up and trying your dad's birthday? <laughs> and you know, In all my years of playing the lottery, I had never, not even once, considered playing my dad's birthday on my mom's birthday. <laughs> and so we ended up with this brilliant community of lateral thinkers <laughs> supporting ourselves in our lottery endeavors. Uh, at, the at the time, none of us had made it big, you know? We weren't well-known lottery players. Uh, none of us really knew what we were doing, but that freed us. I was so inspired by this community that I wanted to devote myself to it full-time. 
Um, so I gathered up some of my closest friends from that community, and I quit my day job as executive vice president of portfolio management services at Lehman Brothers. Uh, and I, I, used, I used some of that nest egg that I had squirreled away. Uh, I bought a little loft on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and, and it became known as, simply, the Lottery Collective. I, I worked at the Lottery Collective for a few years. It was a one in a million experience. Um, I was surrounded by the best and the brightest, and all of us were working hard on lottery permutations, studying the techniques of our heroes, and trying to live as simply as possible. And then I got my big break. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Uh, my win is a story that's been repeated all over the place, and I'm not going to bore you with that today. This is a special crowd uh, of fellow creators, and I owe you something a little different. A lot of people in the creative world don't like to talk numbers. Like, it's a dirty secret that we're not supposed to acknowledge. And I totally understand. What will people think if you share your numbers? What will they do? But while I understand this attitude, I think it's wrong. I think it's incumbent upon me as a successful creator to share my numbers because I could not have gotten here without my blog community, the Lottery Collective, and the giants of yesteryear on whose shoulders I stand. So here we go. These are my numbers. Thank you. Thank you. You're the first to see them. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there are an awful lot of nines uh, and a surprising number of threes. Now, you might not notice this at first, but nine is three times three. <laughs> now, I'm not an economist or a mathematician, so take what I'm about to say here with a grain of salt. But I think this means that there's room out there for niche numbers. Uh, I, and I just want to be totally clear. I'm not saying that you should play a bunch of nines and threes the next time you play the lottery. That would be absurd. Nines and threes worked for me, and they worked for me once, and they're probably not going to work for you. But what I am saying is get a little wild. Stretch a little. Try some eights or a lot of sevens. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, what my lottery ticket shows is that there's room in this world for all kinds of numbers, as long as you build a community around it. <laughs> uh, for the five years that I was full-time running my blog and participating in the Lottery Collective, I spent an average of $2 a day on lottery tickets. I ended up spending about three grand over the course of the experience. And as you can see, that paid off. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But what this really shows is the value of community. <laughs> I, had, I had a small community of about a thousand regular posters and fans on my blog. Uh, to a big advertising company, each one of those people is worth about two cents. But if you take the success of this project at $140 million and divide it by those thousand community members, it turns out that each of my fans is worth $140,000. This is the value of community. <laughs> so to sum things up, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't. But I kept buying lottery tickets anyway and playing numbers that just appealed to me. Uh, but in addition to making things that I liked, I reached out to fellow lottery number creators and general fans of the lottery, and I ended up building a community. And so in the end, I learned the real formula for success. 
Keep buying those lottery tickets. Keep making those connections, and you'll win the lottery too. Thank you. Now, now, okay, so that, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Uh, so that was how I won the lottery, or as I like to call it, every talk ever given by a successful creative person. Um, there are a few key things that I wanted to draw attention to. I was thinking of dropping the mic, but then, you know, uh, that seemed a little, I, I don't know, I was just going to go over this. Um, I actually wrote this talk on the flight home from XOXO last year, and... <laughs> And I was trying to find a venue as cool as XOXO with like the same demographics and stuff. And then Andy was like, do you want to speak next year? And I was like, I already have a talk written. <laughs> um, but it came in under, so you get this part. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is this lottery metaphor itself. Uh, I believe that beyond a certain threshold of work that you put into your projects, success is entirely out of your hands. Um, conceiving of a creative project and building it that's buying the lottery ticket. Like, that's the, that's the, like, hard work and don't be a jerk, like, kind of, like, okay, you've bought your lottery ticket. Great. Um, I make what I like to call weird internet stuff, um, which I've recently come to accept is internet art. Uh, and I, I just want to show you some examples of projects that I made which had good public receptions and projects that I made that basically nobody cared about at all. Um, here's Miraculous Picks. Um, this is, uh, if, if you're familiar with those, those scummy Twitter accounts like, that, that just like get zillions of followers and they post sort of like amazing pics or beautiful pics or whatever and they always get the attributions wrong or they don't attribute or it's like, this is a picture of Hawaii and it's like, no, that's a picture of Bali or whatever. Uh, but they get millions of retweets because they're beautiful pictures and that sort of thing. Uh, and, so, and so I was like, well, I hate these things. Uh, and so I'm going to make one that's just really wrong. And so this just, this, this is a bot that just grabs random um, uh, uh, captions from those scummy accounts and then does a Google image search and just grabs something at random and, uh, uh, and puts them on top of each other. So we get, this is a new level of cuteness or how to kiss a boy <laughs> um, or why do girls text nude pics? Here's why. Uh, and, and this, I, I thought of this project on the way home from work. I got home, I made it, I pushed it online, I had dinner. Um, uh, it took like an hour because it was like two API calls to get the data and then a third API call to, to put it on Twitter. It was pretty easy. Um, and, this, and this got actually a fair amount of traction. I think like, like TLDR wrote an article about this and there were like a few, you know, it got, it got some traction. Sometimes when I talk to people, they say, oh, Miraculous Picks is like my favorite Twitter bot. And like, that's cool. That's, that's awesome. I really like to hear that. Um, here's another one that took uh, about the same amount of work. Uh, it's called uh, Alt Universe Prompts. Get a load of that one. Um, uh, and, and, and what this is, is it goes to, it, it attempts to create um, crossover alternate universe scenario fan fiction um, prompts uh, actually pulled from Archive of Our, Archive of Our Own, which was mentioned uh, uh, earlier uh, today. And uh, it just grabs two characters, and then it goes to Twitter, and it finds someone saying something aspirational, like, I wish I was in bed right now. And then, uh, and then it just snips that off and then puts it next to two characters and drops a heart on it, and, uh, and it creates these prompts. And so we get stuff like this. We get... Um, uh, uh, Quinn Perkins and the 11th Doctor in a basement. That's not going to end well for the Doctor. Uh, and um, cigarette smoking. <laughs> just, you know, uh, that one. That one got some got some faves. Uh, but uh, but for mostly they're just a few people who care about this one uh, quite deeply. And then but it's like the same four people who really like it all the time. Um, so. Uh, uh, um, so yeah, and so I, I like this one as much as I like the last one, and in fact, I put more work into this, but uh, you know, I, I, don't, I never know when I, when I launch something if it's going to get picked up and, and really popular or what. Here's another one that, that I really like and makes me laugh every time I, it comes across my Twitter feed. Um, 
This is like that champagne for my real friends, real pain for my sham friends. Uh, this actually uses WordNick, so thank you, Aaron. Uh, WordNick gives you bigrams, so you can give it a word, and then it'll give you another word that's sort of likely to appear next to it. So naked examination for my closer friends, closer examination for my naked friends. Um, uh, female president for my leftist friends, leftist president for my female friends. Um, and uh, real housewives for my desperate dogs, desperate housewives for my real dogs. Um, I really like this one, and no one cares. Like, no one cares. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then, like, my most popular Twitter bot um, is, came from me noticing a really lazy style of joke on Twitter that I saw repeated over and over and over again, um, where, where, like, two popular, uh, uh, two big news items would happen, uh, and then, like, people would tell the joke where they mix them up. So, like, oh, there's, there's an Apple keynote, and the next Batman was announced, so let's talk about, you know, uh, some Batman Apple joke, right? Um, so I built uh, two headlines, which uh, does stuff like this. Uh, um, and that's 13 Kuwaiti aid-loaded aid trucks enter NASCAR. Um, the, this one is particularly clever, so you know, I picked a good example. But um, uh, all it does is it goes to Google News. It picks headlines from two different categories. Uh, Google News does a little like uh, call out of the main sort of subject of a, of a given headline. And I just find the subject in one, grab a subject from somewhere else, and just swap it in. So this one must have swapped um, like Iraq for NASCAR or something. Um, uh, Google to buy Syria in $3.2 <laughs> billion dollar deal. Um, China to remain an American company. <laughs> so, um, and, and I really like this one just as much as I liked all the other ones, and this one did get fairly popular. Um, uh, and so, you know, I just like there's, it, I don't know what happens to these things after I put them out in the wild. Um, I buy a lot of lottery tickets. Uh, this is a list of every creative project I've released since January 2013, representing 21 months of part-time noodling around with art and technology. Um, these are creative projects that I put anywhere from one to 200 hours of work into. Uh, and what I've learned from doing over 100 projects in the last couple of years is that beyond a certain level of effort, uh, there's basically no correlation between the amount of work you put into something and how successful it is, at least for me. Um, these are projects that I've got significant press recognition for. That's nine out of 112 projects. That actually lines up with, uh, with the Song of Day talk from yesterday pretty nicely. Um, and I believe that once you've made your thing and bought your lottery ticket, uh, everything that comes after that in terms of recognition of what you've done, uh, whether it's good reviews or money or success, is up to some kind of like combination of luck and, and prior privilege. And, that, and uh, uh, you might ask, what about marketing? What about PR? What about knowing your audience? What about making your thing better? Doesn't that help? Um, to me, yes, it does. And that's kind of just buying the lottery ticket. Like, that, that's all, for me, that's all part of buying the lottery ticket, depending on the scope of the project you're releasing. Um, let's, talk, uh, let, let's talk about uh, the coolest. <laughs> just for a bit. This is the most successful Kickstarter ever. $13 million for a cooler with some extra appliances attached to it. This is not a high-end design product like the pen type A or a fancy watch. Uh, it didn't have a slick marketing campaign. Its aesthetic is cheesy like an infomercial and not in an ironic way. Um, so why did it succeed? Well, you might say people clearly want a party-in-a-box supercooler. It must have been the strength of the idea that carried it through. Except if you look at the Kickstarter profile of the guy who invented it, you'll find one other project that he tried to launch on Kickstarter that failed. And that project was the exact same thing six months earlier. <laughs> same thing. Um, the design's a little clunkier, but it's the same idea with complete feature parity, plus even more features like a grill for some reason. <laughs> so what changed? The inventor claims it's because uh, people like coolers more in the summer than in the winter. Okay, does that account for $13 million worth of difference in the, like, the value of your idea and all that work you put in? Uh, he also says it's because he had backers who carried over from the last one. 
all 279 of them. Uh, now, now that's some, some community that's worth something right there. Um, and he said the video was better, but $13 million better? Did he pay Martin Scorsese like $6 million to produce his Kickstarter video? Um, I don't know, perhaps an orange trapezoid is $13 million better than a gray rectangle. Um, regardless, I believe the inventor when he says it could have been a mix of any one of those reasons. Um, I also think it could have been due to the single right person, maybe a TV producer at NBC, seeing a tweet about it because their flight was running late and they glanced at their phone. Um, maybe a butterfly flapped its wings in the rainforest. Um, maybe it's because billions of years ago, two distant galaxies collided and the resulting conflagration fused particles into never-before-seen elements that got violently ejected into our part of the universe, setting in motion a chain of mysterious and unthinkable cosmic events that eventually resulted in the coolest. <laughs> um, this may seem like fatalism. In a sense, it is. There's not much that you can control about your creative success once you've actually made the thing. Uh, and in a sense, there are, there are two kinds of creative advice that I think you can get from creative people. Um, the first is how to buy more lottery tickets, and the second is how to win the lottery. Uh, and I think the former can be extremely useful, uh, and I think the latter is nonsense. Uh, and that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you.